Time has a purpose. Just as the meaning of a sentence becomes clear when we reach its end, so also the meaning of our lives. Death is the one problem that's been with us since the beginning of recorded time. We can extend our days of life, but we cannot fully solve the riddle of death. One day, we'll all end up here. Death is certain, but do we really understand it? Are any of us comfortable with it? Is it a tragedy, a relief, a mystery? It's the biggest question we can ask. What is death? For the Latin American culture, when it comes to the subject of death, we have a very unique understanding, especially when it comes to Mexico. There's a celebration around the time of All Saints Day, where we examine our relationship between life and death. Every single family will build an altar in their homes with pictures of loved ones who have passed away. But it's not a day of mourning. It's Dia de los Muertos, the day of the dead. <laughs> <laughs> 
And when night falls, the cemeteries glow with candlelight. Families gather to eat and be near the graves of their loved ones. Not separated, but together, even in death. Aquí se hace la fiesta, amanecen, viniendo cada año. Pues a cantarle a sus muertos, canciones que le gustaba al muerto, eso les cantamos. We are still connected. It's a very unique way to understand our relationship to life through death. Mexico is not an anomaly in honoring the dead. In fact, throughout most of human history, we've had to encounter death. In ancient cultures, people took great care of their dead. The Romans built catacombs, and some of the most enduring monuments, like the Egyptian pyramids, were built specifically for burial. Even up to our modern age, some have created death masks or used technology, like the photograph, to memorialize the dead. All across the world and throughout the past, there are many other examples of cultures that honor, embrace, or fear death. In our culture, we don't tend to think very deeply about death. I mean, we're frightened of it, of course, because everyone's frightened of death. It's kind of written into our genetic code. We recognize that death is a tragedy. It's something to be avoided at all costs. People will say things like, you know, oh, 60's the new 40, or, uh, right, they always want to focus on youth and energy and activity. In previous cultures, previous eras, we've looked at uh, those who are closer to death as those who've lived a long life and are valuable for that reason. Our culture doesn't value those sorts of things, and partly it's because we've managed to conquer so much of illness and death in the ordinary course of life that death is something we can sort of ignore uh, until we get very old. So we try and sanitize everything in our world to not remind us of it. You know, people go back to work only a few days after losing a beloved wife or a beloved husband, and that's a problem. You know, we need to spend some time dealing with that darker side of, uh, of, of what has happened. It wasn't too long ago that every winter that came around, you weren't sure who was going to make it out on the other side. And so we were confronted regularly with death, and it was a part of life that we had to reflect on, that we had to be prepared for to some extent. Most parishes had what they called the churchyard, and that is to say the graveyard of the church. And so you would walk into Mass and right before you would cross yourself in remembrance of your baptism, you'd walk through and be forced to remember those who had gone on before you, given that same grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide them on into eternal life. We miss this a lot of times when we put death, the dead, and the dying, and even age as far away from us as we can. I am one of the few people in the, in the country who grew up living at a funeral home. My father and uh, six of his brothers and my grandfather were all morticians, and uh, that brings a different perspective on death into a person's life. And my friends would come to visit at the funeral home, and they were always very uh, curious about what a funeral home was like, and when I'd take them to the casket room, that was always an experience, the embalming room even more so. So there was a mixture of both fear and curiosity. Of all creation, we're the only part of creation that is aware we're going to die and the part of creation tries to resist death. The denial of death drives so much of how we live our lives. Blaise Pascal talked about it, about how we use entertainment, how we surround ourselves with distractions in order to avoid the topic of death and dying. We can do all sorts of unhealthy things to kind of make up for the fact that we know we're gonna die. Well, Let's put it off as long as we can. Let's try not to think about it and clothe ourselves with youth because who wants to be old because old means dying. It's very common today for us to sort of defang death. It's just natural, we shouldn't be afraid of it. In a certain sense, um, that's a kind of deception because it refuses to face the question squarely. No, death is a problem. It's not a friend. It's the enemy of human happiness. It makes impossible our desire for permanence. If we don't recognize that death is a problem, we won't search for an answer to that problem, the answer to the question of death. <laughs>
So in order to help people think more deeply about the problem of death, um, we need to do a little background work, right? What does it mean to be human? We share something with the animals, and that is our bodily dimension. We have to feed and breathe and do all the things that animals do to maintain their bodies. But there is something else to us which is absolutely unique. The soul is the spiritual part of us, that spiritual animating element without which the human body is not a living body. So much so that in the absence of a soul, a body is a corpse. The magnitude of the human soul is greater than the whole material universe and of more worth. That's why God is so avid about the salvation of souls because each individual person is worth more than the whole of the material universe combined. Death is experienced as a violent disintegration of the original connection of body and soul in the human being. So one of the definitions of death really is the sundering or separation of body and soul. And the very experience of death is in a certain sense a demonstration of the spirituality of the human being. There's a huge difference, a monumental difference, right? A tragic difference between the person we see before us, the moment before death, and what we see after. There's a natural fear of death because it feels very unnatural for our body and soul to separate. So now we are in a predicament <laughs> uh, in death, the pain, the suffering, the unknown of the separation of body and soul. We just think of death as something that always was. It's just a part of reality. You'll often hear people say, oh, death's just a part of life. Well, not according to Scripture. And there's a very different answer to this question uh, when we compare a secular worldview, where all there is is just the visible material world and there is no God, and a biblical worldview, the, the answer that Scripture gives to this question, where did death come from? The biblical story starts back in Genesis. God created the world in an orderly way so that everything that is there uh, would work together to foster life. Human beings were made to have uh, life in, in a physical way um, and also in a spiritual way, in communion with each other. Uh, with creation and nature, uh, and in communion with God. That changes when the first sin is committed. The fallen angel, Satan, comes to tempt Eve. He invites her to think that maybe God is withholding from her. He says, did God really tell you not to eat from that tree? And she accepts this doubt. She gives it to Adam, and so they eat. They now have disobeyed God, and now they know that they can disobey each other. And the communion between uh, humans and each other, and especially between humans and God, is broken down. And we find out that Adam's own body right, is going to die. God says, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Death enters the picture. No longer will man be preserved from death through God's gift. No longer will immortality belong to man. And we see the entrance of division, of toil, and finally of death. They break the commandment against eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and they sever their connection to the God who is life itself and therefore bring death into human history. Death isn't God's fault. Death is our fault, right? It's a consequence of our sin because God did not make death and he does not delight in the death of the living. Death enters the world as a consequence of Adam and Eve's sin.
Death feels wrong because it's a fruit of a wrong. In death, the body and soul separate. It reminds us of the separation that sin creates between God and humanity. But God doesn't just leave Adam and Eve in their brokenness. God doesn't just leave Adam and Eve in their sinfulness with the punishment of death. God, in the midst of the punishment that they receive, gives them a promise of a savior. God gives the prophecy of how he's gonna solve the problem of sin and death. In the face of death as an enemy, God has made of death a friend. And how does that happen? Well, that happens through the dramatic events of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. And this is the most remarkable turnabout in human history. In a very real sense, you could say it almost reverses human history. God, knowing that man would reject him, knowing that his creation of this world would necessitate his coming as man, he went ahead and said, let there be light. And so he put this wildly improbable proposition into motion. The human race, the human condition, our world, our history, knowing he would have to enter it and take upon himself the guilt of all the sins ever committed throughout human history and be crushed and killed and crucified by it, then rise and destroy the power of it. What God wanted to do was to redeem all of human history to take everything we did, the good and the bad, to come in solidarity with it, to live a truly human life, and to give that story a different ending. Jesus bears the curse of death that was triggered because of sinfulness. He bears that curse on the cross. He takes on the consequences of our sin. Jesus shows us his love by doing this. So death is transformed from a curse to a gift. It's such a surprise. This is the gospel, right? It's good news. It's completely unanticipated. God takes our enemy and makes it the means by which we can come to him. We all long to live forever. We all have this desire to live forever. We are afraid of death and we realize that something's broken inside of us. Something in us is made for more than just this mortal life. And the reason that's the case is because we all have built within to our hearts these echoes of Eden, right? These echoes of that original state of holiness in which God created man and woman not to pass away and die, but for immortality. We have to do kind of the opposite thing that Adam and Eve did, because they looked at the tree of knowledge of good and evil and said, I want to be like God. I want to make my own decisions. The cross is another tree, another block of wood on which Jesus suffered the consequences of sin and our human fallenness. And we're called to look at the cross and say, I want to be like God that way, to say, thy will be done, to follow the path of the cross in which we give up ourselves for the sake of others, just as Jesus did for us. You can either see that moment as the moment in which you lose your life, or you can see that moment as the moment you give your life. And that's what the message of the cross is all about. Christ takes the sting out of death. Now, some people might wonder, well, hold on a second. If Jesus is the new Adam, and if Jesus conquered death on the cross and was raised again, then why do we continue to experience death? And this is really crucial for us to understand so that we can face our own death, right? not from a secular point of view, but from a Christian point of view. Jesus conquers death. He undergoes death. He undergoes the separation of body and soul so that when he rises from the dead and brings them once again together in his glorified self, it makes it a possibility for all of us 
if we will but be baptized. This is what our baptism was all about. Maybe at your baptism or maybe at a recent baptism, you might have heard the words of St. Paul quoted from Romans chapter 6 when he says, don't you know that we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death so that we might live with him? So baptism doesn't make us escape from physical death. What it does is it makes our death into deaths that are like the death of Christ. Through his passion, his death and resurrection, Christ has transformed the curse of death into a blessing. God is not just interested in a spiritual salvation. Salvation isn't just about the salvation of souls. Salvation is also about the salvation of bodies. We as Christians don't think that the body's just a shell that we just chuck aside and, you know, go on up into heaven with all the angels as a kind of spirit. We think that our soul and body are meant to be together. They're meant to be in harmony, and that's who we are. And God respects that. God reintegrates us and brings us back together in the resurrection of the body. Someday, at the end of time, our very bodies will experience the same kind of resurrection that Jesus did. Our bodies will come out of the grave. They will be a resurrected body. They will be united with our souls and will live forever in heaven. In the end, death is fully overcome. It's by way of the rejoining of the glorified soul with a glorified body that death is finally destroyed. So the reunification of the two is fitting. It makes all the sense in the world because this is what God made us to be in the beginning. And we're only fully ourselves, only really persons in the fullest sense, when our souls are rejoined to our body now in glory. We as Catholics treat the bodies of those who have passed with dignity. If you go to Rome, the early Christians carved out places from the grounds. We call them the catacombs. And they renamed them cemeteries, which means resting place. And the idea is that the body that's here is just resting. It's waiting to wake up in the resurrection of the dead. St. Augustine in his incredible wisdom understood that rest was at the heart of the plot of Scripture, that God was inviting us into his rest. And so he begins the confessions with that incredible insight that our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. This idea of rest, that we're drawn towards, that the rest is a goal, is something that keeps being played out throughout the biblical story. God makes creation, and he makes man and woman at the climax of that creation on day six, but he makes us for the rest on the seventh day. We lose the Garden of Eden, that place of rest with God, but then we're set on a journey. We see this with the whole story of the Exodus. Israel is in slavery and bondage, and God promises them to draw them out of their bondage to bring them to a place of rest. The promised land, this promised place of rest and paradise, was a figure, a symbol of the ultimate place of rest, which was heaven. The story of the Exodus is not over. It's what we are called into in the Christian life. That's our goal, is to get out of a life of sin, and to be brought to communion with God himself. Ultimately, to enter into the promised land. We know death is the end of our earthly pilgrimage. We also know that death is not the end of the story. That when God becomes man in Christ Jesus, he enters into this mystery of death and transforms it from the inside out. The curse becomes a blessing. Christ, when he comes, he turns the grave from a hole into a door. Death is no longer a pit, but a door, a door into eternal life. If we've already died with Christ and participate in his resurrection, death has no more power over us. The fear of death has no more power over us. 
Death, while it seems to be the overwhelming reality of our time here on this earth, is not the overwhelming reality, is not the biggest reality. The biggest reality is, is Christ's resurrection. This is what we've longed for. This is what we were made for. We are made to spend eternity with God in heaven. Death is coming home.